Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and today we have a very special guest podcast. I was at the Blood and Sand Conference in the Bahamas, and Mike Mallon got up there and gave a lecture that just blew me away. And the first thing I said when I went up to him afterwards, after saying that was an amazing job, was, can we put it on MCRIT? And uh, he said yes, so you're going to get it to enjoy Mike Mallon's incredible talk, The Day I Didn't Use Ultrasound. Before we go there, let me wish you all a happy holidays, uh, and thank you for all of the great contributions you've made to the MCRIT podcast. Uh, big changes in the year we are finishing out right now, added Palm Crit uh, to MCRIT. Uh, there's going to be some more changes going forward, and these changes are going to be all good. Um, so without any further ado, this is Scott Weingart for the MCRIT podcast, welcoming Mike Mallon of the Ultrasound Podcast to tell us about the day he did not use ultrasound. I gotta admit, I'm a little nervous giving this talk. The material that I'm going to present to you today, I learned from uh, some of my idols in emergency medicine who unfortunately are currently in the audience watching me present the material. So I'm a bit stressed, I'm a bit nervous. And I'm gonna talk to you today about something that I don't normally talk about. I don't think I've ever given a conference lecture that's not about ultrasound. And today we're gonna to change that. The reason I'm the one up here talking to you today instead of one of these geniuses is because I had a patient experience about a month and a half ago that has sort of changed the way I practice. It's probably an experience I'm never gonna forget and it was, it was very meaningful to me. I can see it so vividly in my mind. It's almost like it was etched in stone. It's so, it's so memorable to me. It was the day that I didn't use ultrasound. <laughs> Let me paint a picture for you. I'm an attending physician. I work in an academic center. This was a particularly slow day. I had been at work all day at meetings, so I've been working pretty hard. During the day, we were interviewing fellow applicants, and that evening, that shift that evening, it was pretty relaxed. And as you know, if, you, if any of you are attending physicians, you don't necessarily have to work that hard. And this particular night shift, I was working really hard at not working hard. I was sitting at the computer, fairly relaxed. There's not a lot of patients there. There's three emergency residents in the department who uh, are all very good at what they do, and they were seeing all the patients, and I was just kind of kicking back. And I tend to sit right next to the charge nurse desk because I like to hear what's coming in. I like to know what's going on. I want to know if there's an EMS call. I want to know when I need to be prepared. And I'm totally chilling right there, and I kind of see the triage nurse kind of scurry along the hall, like maybe a little bit more rapidly than she normally does. Uh, and she walks up to the charge nurse, and I kind of overhear something to the degree of sats of 48%. Now, I immediately sort of furrow my brow and think to myself, there's no way in hell there's someone with sats of 48% in triage. Like, how do you walk into an emergency department with sats of 48%? And if they were really that sick, wouldn't she be pushing them back right now? Why would she be coming up to inform the charge nurse that I've got someone in triage with sats of 48%? It doesn't make any sense. So I didn't really believe it. But nonetheless, I decided to get up, which was tough. And I walked all the way to the resuscitation room, which is about 20 feet away, also challenging. I'm standing there in the resuscitation room, and the triage nurse is in there with me because we both are aware of the fact that supposedly there's someone with sats of 48% coming back. And we're kind of joking about how, like, there's no way this person's actually got sats of 48, and we're trying to guess, like, what the sats are. It's like, I bet it's 92. She's like, I bet it's 93. And um, I'm, I'm sitting up there, and, uh, and this, this guy gets pushed in in a wheelchair. And... I'm immediately like taken aback by the way this guy looks. I'm confused. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Like I look at him and I haven't seen this before. Like this guy's he's working hard kind of. He looks like he's having he looks like he's distraught. Like he is nervous about something. It looks like he's kind of sort of working to breathe, but yet his, his respiratory rate's not fast. It doesn't look like he's taking in big inspirations. He's just kind of looks like he can't really breathe, but it doesn't make sense because it doesn't fit with his respiratory rate and how he is actively trying to breathe. So I kind of, I try to talk to him. I say, hi, how are you doing? Are you okay? What's your name? And he kind of looks up at me out of the corner of his eye and just sits there and just keeps breathing, doesn't say a word back to me. And then the next thing I know, he pushes up off the wheelchair on his own strength, trembling under his arms, and he like throws himself onto the bed. And immediately, right at that moment, I realize this guy's gonna die on me. 
And at that particular moment, I realized what's going on with his respiration is not the fact that he's not trying to breathe, he's tiring out, he's given up. He's been breathing this hard for this long. And I immediately recognized that. At first I'm frozen. I don't really know what to do because I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't think this guy's sats were really gonna be 48%. I didn't really, I, I didn't know what was going on with him. I was initially confused and I don't really know what to do. But then I, I grasped myself after just a couple of seconds and I'm saying, I need an IV right now. I recognize the urgency of the situation. And I, I yell at the techs to grab me an, I, an IV because we don't have access on this guy. He came in from triage. I yell at another tech to start working on an IO and his tibia. And they start doing those things. I sit him up in bed because he, he threw himself down onto a flat bed. And I put some oxygen on him. And I just kind of wait for what felt like eternity, but was really only like five seconds. One of the residents scurries into the room and we're standing there trying to help this guy breathe, trying to open up his airway. The attending who owns the room walks into the room, the other two residents come into, and the attending um, suggests maybe we should uh, try bagging the patient. So we try bagging the patient. We still don't have IV access. We still don't have an IO. We bag him for a minute We've got him on the monitor at this point. His sats are in the 50s to 60s uh, with the oxygen that we've been giving him, recognizing the fact that we're going to have to intubate this guy, but we don't have access, and he's still awake enough to prevent us from intubating him. At this point, his heart rate starts to drop. It was initially in the hundreds, and then I watch it drop to the 90s, and then to the 80s, and then to the 70s and the 60s. About this point, he starts to seize, which I presume is from hypoxia. So now he's clamped down. He's out of it, right? So I could technically intubate him based on the fact that he's not awake and I wouldn't have to intubate an awake guy, but he's now clamped down. Um, about the time he seizes, his heart rate's continuing to drop, we get the IV. And I yell to the resident and I tell her that I want, him to, I want her to intubate the patient as soon as he relaxes from his seizure. About the same time, his heart rate's dropping, the other attending asks for um, atropine and we give atropine into the IV that we just got and around that time he stops seizing and she takes a look her words are I can't see anything and right as she says that the other resident who's come into the room and prepared the glide scope pushes the glide scope in and she very quickly this is a very very talented resident she pulls the the DL out and she puts in the VL and we see this at this point my heart sinks if, as if it wasn't sunk already. So I'm, I recognize the situation. I recognize that I don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> and there's no way I'm getting a tube past that. She asked for a bougie, I asked for a Krite kit. Within seconds, one of the techs hands me the Krite kit, which I uh, immediately open up. At this point, I've got tunnel vision. Everything in the center of my vision is completely clear and everything in the periphery is completely blurry but I can see exactly what I'm doing. And I, can, I recognize the situation. I'm talking to myself. I'm saying, I'm cracking this guy. I'm cracking this guy. I'm cracking this guy right now. I'm cracking this guy. So I open the Krite kit. We have the difficult airway Krite kit, which has 7,000 instruments in it. There's a ridiculous number of things in it. And I, I don't know how I did it so quickly, but because I don't use this thing very often. I open it every once in a while you know, to ward off evil demons, like we like to say in the emergency department. So I open it and I immediately grab the scalpel, I grab the hook, and I grab the Shiley and push the introducer through the Shiley. While I'm doing this, my pharmacist, of all people, I love my pharmacist, hands me a boat of four by fours with betadine already, already sprayed on it. <clears throat> At this moment, I'm recognizing I've got everything now, I actually have to crack the patient. So I kind of like take a second. I take this breath, just one breath, and I look around the room Erica's trying to pass a bougie through this. The other attending is currently pushing epi because we just lost the pulse on this patient. I brush his hand out of the way, take the betadine and just scrub it on the guy's neck a couple of times. And then with my scalpel in my right hand, shaking profusely, I grab his larynx, I grab his thyroid cartilage and I shake it around a bit and I try to pick it up a little. And then I take my index finger and I touch down on his thyroid, and I try to feel his cricothyroid membrane. This guy has a neck that's bigger than his head. It's just flabby. He's just one of those dudes with a flabby neck. I can't see any landmarks. I can't even feel his cricothyroid membrane. 
So I've moved my index finger out of the way and bracing my wrist on his sternum, I start slicing with a, uh, a vertical incision. And I probably slice eight times until I feel the sandpaper of the thyroid cartilage under the blade. And he was bleeding, he wasn't bleeding a lot, probably because he was so clamped down, but I still couldn't see anything, but I felt the thyroid cartilage as I hit it, as I nicked it with the blade, and I stopped, and I put my finger down, and then I could feel the cricothyroid membrane. I did a horizontal stab incision with the blade, took my left hand, grabbed the hook, put the hook in with the blade, just keeping the blade sort of sideways, grabbed the thyroid, picked it up a bit, put the blade down, grabbed the shiley, put the shiley in, we put the Shiley in. Uh, as soon as I did that, the residents all, were all prepared. They had the bag ready. They threw the bag on, started ventilating him, although we didn't have the cuff up at that point. I pushed the cuff up, cuff up um, pretty quickly, although I didn't initially have the 10cc syringe right there. Right then, uh, I just <laughs> threw everything down and started doing compressions, which was probably just the sympathetic like overload. Like, I'm just ah, <laughs> like, <laughs> push on this guy. We're, we're doing compressions, and I, I, I talked to the room, and I'm like, we're going to do compressions for two minutes. Erica, I want you to get the ultrasound ready uh, with gel on it, and we're going to take a look at his heart at the end of two minutes. He had, at this point, gotten one amp of atropine and maybe one or two amps of epi. We looked with ultrasound after that two minutes, and he had this beautiful, strong heartbeat um, because it was a hypoxic arrest, and we fixed his hypoxia. My tunnel vision went away, and yet I was still just like, just overcome with the stress of the situation. And everybody, everybody else in the room was, was pumped and excited and wanted to like high five and chest bump and do all this other stuff. And like, I, I could barely talk. I, I was just like, I was literally like, I remember like looking at the one of the residents and like literally trembling my hands and being like, Jesus. I was just trembling so bad. And then I walked out of that room, which is the trauma bay and immediately went to go see the chronic abdominal pain patient that had been there for an hour and a half waiting to see me to fix her problems that she'd had for six, to, six months to a year or something like that. I apologized to her and told her that we'd been a little busy with the patient in the other room, um, and she was very nice about it. I probably could have done things better during this crike. I probably could have made better decisions. I probably could have performed quicker. I could have acted um, more aggressively early in the, in the whole situation. I could have not frozen in the first couple of seconds. I'm not going to talk to you today about the crike. I'm going to leave that to the master. Instead, I want to talk to you today about stress, about crisis, about how we as physicians respond to stress and crisis in these sorts of situations. And in reality, this is probably the thing that prevents us from performing at the top of our game, right? The medicine's not that hard. We can all listen to podcasts. We can all memorize this material. We can all talk through a crike. Whether you actually can perform that crike or that procedure, that thoracotomy in real time is all about how well you can compose yourself in the moment, how prepared you are for that, that adrenaline rush, because none of us can fight the fight or fight response. Cliff Reed likes to call this flight, fight, or freeze, which in our game is probably even more realistic because none of us are going to run from a trauma bay. We're either going to fight, we're going to try to help the patient, or we're going to freeze. We're going to just sit there and not know what to do, and then somebody else is going to take over. <clears throat> fight or flight response, you guys are all aware of it. It's your pupils dilate, your respiratory rate increases, your heartbeat starts to fly, you get uh, peripherally constricted. Um, it's what happens when you see a snake, right? If anybody here has ever seen a snake and felt that, that heart dropping moment where you can feel your stomach down in, your, down in the bottom of your bowels, that's the flight or fight response. That's continually affected by the parasympathetic response, which we often have after eating, before eating, uh, when we're tired, when we're in attending, sitting around in the emergency department. That's the thing that at that moment is controlling your system. And it's this constant balance between the fight or flight response. And I'm, some of you are probably saying right now that, well, an airway isn't like seeing a snake. Who here has done a crike? Who here has had a bad airway? Almost everybody's raising their hand. Who here feels like that bad airway wasn't scary? Nobody's raising their hand. These are life and death situations where we feel responsible for what happens to the patient. So the more we recognize that our stress is going to be through the roof, the better we're going to be able to cope with that stress in the moment. So I want to talk about two different types of stress, psychological and cognitive stress. Psychological stress is that thing that uh, sort of creates difficulty performing tasks, right? This is what we talk about a lot, and you guys have probably heard from the podcast from these geniuses that have been podcasting about it for about a year. 
Cognitive stress is something that's a little bit different that we don't talk about as much, but I want to bring up today, and that's the difficulty of making decisions, which in my mind, one of the hardest parts about doing a crike is making the decision to do the crike. So I want to talk about that cognitive stress. First though, we'll start off with the psychological. There's three books that I'm going to mention. The first one is On Combat by Dave Grossman which if you haven't read, you definitely should read. I think it's a must read for emergency medicine. Warrior Mindset is kind of a continuation in my mind of on combat in terms of the material that you get out of it. And then there's one that I'm not sure has been brought up before. It's called Deep Survival, which is one of my favorite books. It's an amazing book about life and death decisions, surviving in the wilderness and how some people survive and some people die. And we'll talk about that. But first, I'd like to take the conditions that Dave Grossman created for crisis, for psychological stress, and apply those to my patient encounter that I just told you about. So he broke things into white, yellow, red, gray, and black. White being the chillest, black being the most flight or fighty response, right? So when I was sitting there, feet up, being in attending, chilling out, I was at white, right? When you're at white, your heart rate's normal. There's no physiologic changes, you're basically unaware, you're not really alert, and you're practically sleeping, which is about where I was during that shift. When I heard 48%, I jumped to yellow. Now your heart rate's still normal at yellow, but at that point you're prepared, you're aware, right? Imagine a dog scurrying, scurrying around a room. Dogs are always at yellow, they don't have a white. But there's no physiologic changes at this point. This is actually a great place to perform, especially if you're doing fine motor tasks. I was still at yellow when I was confused by that guy because I hadn't figured out what was going on yet, right? I hadn't, I hadn't had that aha moment where I realized he was trying to die in front of me. When I first hit red was when he pushed himself up off the wheelchair and fell onto the gurney. When I realized that this guy's gonna try to die in front of me and that's when your heart rate first starts to increase. So in red, your heart rate goes from about 115 to 145, but you're at peak cognition. That's like the time when your brain is the most aware. Your reaction time is actually really good. Your complex motor is actually really good, but you start to lose some of that fine motor, right? So some might argue that a crike is a fine motor movement or a complex, depending on who you talk to. Might be a great question for Rich later. But if you're trying to do something very specific, red is kind of tough. If you're trying to say, for example, like thread a needle. Now, if you're trying to fight off an army of binary soldiers, red is exactly where you want to be, right? For that complex motor. But then when you start to try to do something very, very delicate, red's a bad place to be because you kind of start to lose that fine motor. Who here has tried to pass a wire through a dilator before when you're stressed out? You get in the trauma bay, you've got a sick trauma patient, you're trying to get that, that central in as quick as possible. And that freaking wire, man, it just flies around like crazy. It's like, it's like I'm not even moving. It's like there's wind blowing or something. The wire's like hitting you in the face. If you take that wire and you hold it your hands together, you grab that wire and you grab the tip of the dilator and you hold your hands together like this, you can make that wire easily go into the dilator. Because whether you recognize it or not, the reason that wire is moving is because you're moving, right? You're stressed, but you give it something to anchor onto and all of a sudden you can control that wire. Just like she's doing here, passing that thread through the needle. Another principle here is that you can actually preload things, right? So if you get something already loaded and ready to go, you don't have to fumble with trying to load it. Those delicate tasks that require fine motor, get those ready before the instance where you're gonna be stressed out. And then finally, breathing. Right before I started cracking this guy, I took a deep breath. I don't know where that came from. I don't know if that was, if I decided to do that, if I said, hey, Rich and Scott and Rob told me to take a deep breath here. I'm gonna take a deep breath. I don't remember saying that to myself, but for whatever reason, I took a deep breath and it gave me enough relaxation to perform the task at hand. Sports figures do this all the time. Every time somebody takes a free throw, what do they do, right? Doosh, doosh, doosh. Whew. Then they go for it, right? That breath, that relaxation takes them from red to yellow so they can perform that fine motor task. When I saw the guy's epiglottis, I was definitely in the gray. I had that tunnel vision. My heart rate was through the roof. I could feel my pulse pounding in my chest. I had sort of slow motion perception. I couldn't really hear other people in the room. Like all of a sudden, everything just went, I'm focused in on the task at hand, which was the crike. And I couldn't think about anything else going on around me. I was literally on autopilot. I never made it to black, luckily. Black is, black is pretty much considered the place where you shit your pants. And, um, Although it would have been a great story if I'd actually crapped my pants <laughs> taking care of this patient. <clears throat> Luckily I didn't. 
In black, you, you lose your forebrain. You can't think anymore. Like you literally can't make decisions when you're in the black. You're in fight or flight or freeze. You've got a rational thought. Your heart rate's huge. Sometimes you lose your bowels. You lose your near field vision and you've got extreme vasoconstriction. These are the people that are sitting, standing there pale in the room, not doing anything. Recognize these people in these situations and help them. Move them out of the way or talk to them. Get them out of it somehow. So what I learned. The first thing I learned is that the hardest part about this whole case was the decision to crack the patient. And that's where I want to talk about Lawrence Gonzalez and deep survival. Obsessed with these decisions that we make in crisis situations. And one of the things struck me in his book, he said that in a crisis situation, 90% of people can't think straight. And of the 10% that can think straight, 5% still make the wrong decision because they're not actually present in the moment. They don't realize the decision that they're making and they're not aware of what's actually happening around them. He explains this with a concept called mental maps. A mental map is basically a blueprint of your surroundings. It's the idea of how you perceive something to go. When you walk into a room and prepare to intubate a patient, you have a mental map of how you expect that innovation to go best description I've heard of, Lawrence uses in his book, and he says that if you're looking for your lost Moby Dick book, you're going to scan your entire house, not reading every title, you're going to look for that blue book, right? If for whatever reason you created that mental map of the Moby Dick book in your brain and made it red, you would spend your entire day looking for the Moby Dick book, but you'd never find it. Problems occur when people bend their mental map when they don't recognize that the map has changed, the situation is different, and they try to bend reality to fit what they expected to happen. That's why people die in the wilderness. Off to sleep. The first mask wouldn't fit, they tried a second mask. Why am I having problems here? I don't know, I'll open this. Hold down a bit, let me push the head back a bit more. They then tried some extra drugs to try and reduce some suspected tension in the uh, muscles in the jaw. So it was obvious uh, almost straight away that things were going wrong. We know that two minutes in, Elaine's oxygenation was 75% and falling, and she was by this time already visibly blue. Within four minutes, we know that her oxygenation had fallen to 40% or lower. There's some confusion about the precise time, but we know that six to eight minutes in, a number of things were happening. The anaesthetist had already started to attempt to intubate Elaine. The oxygenation was still at 40% or lower. The heart rate was falling. The ENT surgeon waiting to perform the op came into the theatre. An anaesthetist from an adjoining theatre became aware of a commotion, and he walked in to see what could be done. And at least three nurses answered a call for help. And what happened is that the three consultants continued with the attempts to intubate and they used a variety of different techniques and a variety of different pieces of equipment. The nurses, meanwhile, performed some, uh, some tasks under their own initiative. But what we can say is that 10 minutes in, with hindsight, this is a situation of can't intubate, can't ventilate. This is a recognised emergency in anaesthesia for which guidelines exist. We're now 10 minutes into this attempted procedure. The uh, patient, my wife, is blue. Her oxygenation is 40% or lower, and it has been for six minutes. The anaesthetist has 16 years experience, and he is regarded as diligent by his colleagues. The ENT surgeon has over 30 years experience. The other anaesthetist has additional skills pertaining to difficult airways and three of the four nurses are all experienced in their job. And it's perhaps worth just wondering at this stage what was going through their mind. The intubation attempts had failed, the oxygenation was very low. What we know actually happened is this point in, 10 minutes for a further 15 minutes, the three consultants would appear to have continued with their attempts to intubate to the exclusion of any other option. And that at the end of that 15 minutes, we're now 25 minutes into the whole procedure, 
they eventually get Elaine's oxygenation to 90%, but she's actually been at 40% or lower for a total now for over 20 minutes. Keep going. Can we get above 90? Nope, she won't go up. No, you got 90 though. That's better. I don't think we should carry on with the operation. No, I agree. I think we should abandon it at this stage. Okay. The airway itself is not secure though and so they fiddle around a bit more and in fact her oxygenation falls again below 90% for a further 10 minutes and finally by the time we're 35 minutes in they seem to make the decision that the best thing is just to let her wake up naturally. Let's wheel her back, quick as we can. and they transfer her to the recovery room. She lays there for an hour and a half, and of course, she never wakes up. I think this is a perfect example of taking seasoned physicians that know how to perform a necessary procedure um, who don't update their mental map. They walked into that operating room, into that operating theater, with the expectation that they had a healthy 30-year-old female who was going to be inti, easy to intubate or easy to put in an LMA. And then instead of saying, well, we can't ventilate this lady, we can't intubate this lady, we need to crike her, they probably said, well, there's no way we need to crike this lady. I mean, she's a healthy 30-year-old female, and if we crike her, then she's going to have a scar on her neck. We just got to intubate this lady. We just got to intubate her. They bent reality to fit the mental map that they had created walking into that room. And Lawrence Gonzalez brings up a few criteria of people that often don't survive in the wilderness. It's people that don't update their mental map, people that aren't present in the situation, and often it's the people who have the most experience. It's the people that are used to it going a certain way. You take an ENT surgeon who's probably done thousands of trachs and he didn't crack this lady. He's used to it going a certain way. He's probably never had to crike a 30-year-old healthy female for an elective operation before. The anesthesiologist probably hadn't either. And for whatever reason, they couldn't reset their mental map and make the decision to crike this lady. There's a few things we can do to prevent this from happening to us. Have a simple algorithm. Rich talks about this all the time, right? This is the idea that you don't want to have 40 different things that you have to do to come to a single decision. It's got to be easy. There's got to be a couple of different options, right? Because you're not going to be able to go through that entire algorithm in a crisis situation. Reevaluate the situation regularly, right? If you need to, talk it about it out loud. Just go over it with the entire room and talk about what's happening to your patient. Think out loud to the team. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that we're all human, and I definitely learned this from this particular case. In fact, when the flight or fight response occurs, you're not actually activating the forebrain. The entire flight or fight response includes portions of the brain that don't include decision making, right? So it doesn't matter how trained you are, how well you make decisions, how prepared you think you are, your response is often not controlled by you. Not just me, but we're all human. And I, I was going to bring up Scott at this point in the lecture, and now I feel weird because he's standing five feet from me. But I remember um, uh, at Smack in Australia, I, uh, I had a conversation with Scott after Sim Wars. And we were talking about some, some like, idea we had, some, some thing we were planning on doing, and I kind of grabbed him right after Sim Wars. And, you know, it, to Scott's defense, he had been up on stage for an hour and a half being yelled at by people and trying to make these crisis decisions in front of thousands of people that was being video recorded and played for thousands of people online. And I remember thinking afterward, I was like, man, Scott just seems totally out of it. What's going on with that guy? And I realized later, I was like, oh, he was just stressed out. He just had a super stressful event. This happens to all of us. This happens to Scott, who is like one of you know, my heroes and the guy that I imagine can handle any crisis situation whatsoever, yet he was still a little bit stressed out from this Sim Wars event. Sorry to bring you out, Scott. No, it's all true. Even IndyCar racers. This is an IndyCar racer who is seasoned. His lowest respiratory rate through turn 15 was 26 and his heart rate was 174. How do you perform fine motor skills like turning a wheel when your heart rate's 174 and your respiratory rate is 26? So I guess the question is, at what level of stress is the best, right? And there's actually 
some good data here that it's an upside down U. You don't want to be at white because you're not going to be reactionary. And you don't want to be at black because you're pooping your pants. You want to be somewhere in the middle. And in medicine, I think it kind of sits in between yellow and red, right? You want to be, you want to be pretty, pretty stressed out, pretty freaked out, but you want to still retain some of that fine motor. And it turns out that you can actually change your graph so that instead of a U, it actually has a shoulder on it so that you can perform as well in the red and gray as you do in the yellow and red. And the way to do that is mostly through something called stress inoculation. So I'm going to talk about two different ways to improve your ability to deal with these situations. The first is preparation and the second is reaction. As far as preparation goes, by far the best thing you can do is stress inoculate yourself. Sounds terrible, but you basically put yourself in these stressful situations and force yourself to make cognitive not just errors, but make cognitive decisions in these stressful situations so that you get more used to it. And you are able to actually sort of tap into your frontal lobe a little bit more when you're freaked out. The best way to do that by far is through simulation. We do some simulation here and you recognize that you're stressed out during those environments. Maybe it's not quite as bad as criking a patient who's dying in front of you, but you're still stressed out. You're training yourself to manage these instances. We actually know that you remember things better when you're stressed out. There's pretty good data that you could actually improve your 24 hour recall if the thing that you learned happened while you had cortisol release as opposed to just being comfortable sitting around. This is why pimping works, right? You're freaked out because someone's pimping you. You are actually gonna remember that better if you're getting pimped than if you were just casually having a conversation with your attending. Another thing you can do because we can't always be in simulation environments is actually mentally rehearse the concept. So think about cracking somebody. Go through the steps in your mind. It turns out that when we look at uh, functional MRI data, you're actually activating almost the exact same areas of your brain just by going through it in your mind as opposed to actually performing the task. So you can create motor memory to some degree just by thinking about doing it. So actually just sitting there and saying, all right, I'm cracking the patient, I'm grabbing the thyroid, I'm slicing in a vertical incision, I'm horizontally stabbing. You can actually create that muscle memory. Even better is if you create that muscle memory through visualization and then also make it a scary situation, right? So if instead of just thinking about a, like a nice normal anatomy neck, you actually think about trying to crack this guy, right? It's important that you make these instances vivid, that you visualize the sticking points, that you imagine success. Never imagine that you fail and never allow someone to fail in a situation. When you allow someone to fail in simulation, you're actually creating a negative feedback loop and that's gonna hit them the next time they get in a stressful environment. So people in simulation, you gotta push them, but they should always succeed. Otherwise, you just give them psychological stress and PTSD, really. We talked about breathing. By far, probably the most important thing you can do in the actual moment itself, right? Can't prepare anymore. Now you're in the moment, you're, it's game day. You've gotta do something, breathe. If they don't have a way that you like to breathe, then tactical breathing is four seconds in, four seconds out. Some people give it a four second hold. You only gotta do it once. Obviously, the more you can do it, the better. But if you can just stand there for a second, just hold yourself, compose yourself. The most important part is thinking about the breath. Take yourself out of the situation for a moment. Think about the breath. You'll perform better than if you hadn't done it. And then self-talk. I think we probably all do this to some degree. Uh, a few years ago, my self-talk was a little bit more profane than it is these days. I was a little bit more negative about things, thinking to myself like, oh crap, oh crap, I can't get this, I'm not gonna get this. Since then, I've managed to change that around a little bit, so now I say things to myself like, all right, Mike, you can do this, you, can, you got this, you know how to do this, you can do this. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're saying to yourself, think through the situation, give yourself positive feedback. It sounds corny, but it totally works. So whatever you choose to improve your reaction to these situations, just remember that the more you prepare for this, the better you're going to perform. And if you prepare for it just a little bit, chances are you'll be able to pre perform through a situation like this a lot better than some ultrasound jerk.